Okay, welcome everyone to the next in our seminar series for the Unify Consortium. Uh, today we have a guest speaker, Addison Lee from a Hawaiian Electric Company. Addison is one of the lead transmission planning engineers at Hawaiian Electric. He's worked at, tra in transmission planning for eight years and performed many major studies for the company and has been involved in all major recent IPP project procurements. And today, Addison is going to talk about Hawaii's path to 100% renewable with a focus hopefully around some of the grid forming technologies that you guys are thinking about installing out in Hawaii to help maintain grid stability. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Addison and let him give the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ben. Uh, hope you can hear me okay. Uh, so good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's nice to meet you all, and it's an honor to be here today presenting on behalf of Hawaiian Electric. My presentation today will go over Hawaii's path to 100% renewable. So here's an overview of what I'll be covering today. Uh, information on our integrated grid planning or IGP process. So its purpose, its outcome and structure, mainly focusing on how we are using this process to help us achieve our 100% renewable energy goals. And I'll be providing background on our latest renewable energy procurements, which are the stage one and two RFPs and the major system studies related to these large procurements. And then finally, going over the detailed study results, conclusions, and recommendations of the island-wide EMT studies of grid forming inverters that was performed as part of the stage two interconnection requirement studies. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Hawaiian Electric, I'll just spend a few minutes to briefly describe our system. So we have three major islands, Oahu, Maui, and Hawaii Island, each with separate and isolated power grids. So there aren't any tie lines uh, between each island grids, making each island dependent on their own generating resources. We also manage smaller systems on Molokai and Lanai, but won't be the, discussing those today. The peak load on each island is about 1.1 gigawatts for Oahu and around 200 megawatts for Maui and Hawaii. So our goal for the future is 100% renewables by 2045. Uh, back in 2015, our state made a commitment to a clean energy future of getting to 100% renewables by 2045. Uh, this measurement is called the Renewable Portfolio Standard, or RPS, and is measured in percent. Uh, it defines the percentage of energy that must be generated from renewable energy resources. And in addition to 2045, uh, we have intermediate benchmark years shown here uh, with increasing RPS requirements to help keep our state on track. Uh, so how are we doing? Uh, back in 2021, so last year, we reported about 38% consolidated RPS across all systems. And in 2020, we reported 34.5% with the renewable generation type split into these percentages below in this bar, bar chart here. So note these percentages are for 2020 only. And I want to point out that Customer DER is one of the largest contributors. You can see here about 15 to 23%. And the next largest contributor is, is wind energy in this dark blue here. Uh, so as you can see, we reached our 2020 goal of 30%, but we still have significant strides to make for these next milestone years. Uh, to support this stride, our company has developed a planning process called Integrated Grid Planning, or IGP. So what is IGP and its outcome? IGP is an energy planning process, kind of like a business strategic planning process. We gather data and develop a plan to provide insights and directions for the future. So in order to meet customer needs, uh, regulatory requirements, and our clean energy goals. The outcome is a five-year action plan with strategies that will be used for 
long-term decision making. So the graphic here on this slide shows the five major steps of the IGP process. And this is targeted to be a two-year planning process. Uh, in step one here, we collect the data from experts and stakeholders, including the public and various key factors that will impact the plan. Uh, in step two, this data is then analyzed and used to determine what the system grid needs are and what it might cost. In step three, the plan is then refined based on proposals gathered for potential projects. Uh, so this includes actual costs. So let's say, for example, if you were remodeling your kitchen, you might have an idea of what you want and how much it might cost, but you won't have actual costs until you have bids put together by like some contractors. So obtaining these bids is a similar process we'll undergo in order to gather uh, potential projects and their actual costs. So using that information in step four, the plan is further revised and optimized using the best solutions to fill the grid needs uh, within the, the scheduled timeframe. And then finally in step five, uh, regulators will be provided or presented with the solutions for their review. Okay, uh, here's a more detailed view of how the plan will be developed within the IGB process. The process begins with the box on the left here, inputs, assumptions, constraints, and scenarios. And these are fed into distribution models such as uh, load seer synergy and production simulation models like Resolve and Plexus. So the productions, production models identify the resource additions and the timings of when they'll be added to the portfolio. Uh, these production simulation model outputs are then fed into uh, my starting point assumption for transmission planning, where we run simulations and determine whether the portfolio is viable. So as far as for our, my work, uh, we'll determine any additional new resources that are needed for stability, such as maybe synchronous condensers, stack comms, new transmission lines, or any other non-wires alternatives. And if needed, uh, the process can be reiterated at any stage via these red lines or red arrows here. Okay. okay but prior to this uh, IGB process that I just described, we performed two major RFP procurements for renewable energy resources, which are the stage one and stage two projects. And as a result of these large procurements, we also conducted several major system studies uh, with one of them still ongoing today. So the stage one and stage two RFP procurements awarded the total amount of solar and battery energy storage capacities that I shown here. We have about 371 megawatts of PV, 556 megawatts S for Oahu, uh, 175 megawatt PV, and 215 megawatt S for Maui, and 120 megawatt PV, and 132 megawatt S for Hawaii Island. Uh, these are mostly paired PV and BES projects, so about a four hour duration on those projects for the best megawatt hour size. And we have a few standalone battery energy storage projects, which are used for like load shifting or contingency response. The commercial operations date for these projects are pretty tight, expected to come align within the next two years. So this uh, largely restricted the variety of renewable energy resources that were procured in this RP. So like no wind, geothermal, et cetera, these projects that might have like a long development timelines. Uh, unfortunately, there have been a few stage two projects that dropped out in the recent months after these studies were completed. And yeah, we have been affected by the pandemic such as uh, supply chain issues. 
Uh, but even though the numbers here will be lower in the future, our study has still included this large amount of renewable penetration. And also, we're studying with uh, developer provided models. Okay, so the studies performed over the past two years are shown here. Uh, starting with the stage two RFP, half of those projects were awarded. The system impact study, oh, so we call it system impact study, uh, renamed from the traditional IRS. Uh, this started right away with uh, model checkouts. So just uh, model out of seek checking, see if they, they could run and perform basic uh, test simulations. Uh, so traditional IRS was performed mainly in PSSE with some PSCAD in order to analyze power flow and stability impacts of adding these new projects. So this is uh, mainly focused on the grid following implementation of the developer models. So this is the grid following portion that you see here. In addition to that, uh, grid forming was a new requirement for all projects in this RFP. All projects had to be capable of quote unquote uh, grid forming. And it was a loose definition of what we understood about grid forming at the time. So just some generic language such as uh, had to be like, had to operate like a voltage source. So in addition to this grid following study, we contracted, contracted uh, a stability study to be performed entirely in EMT software to study the effects and capabilities of grid forming inverters. So, so why do we need this EMT study in addition to PSSE? Well, at the time we had concerns regarding the, limit, the limitations of positive sequence simulations like the accuracy of PCC simulations, uh, sometimes we would see numerical instability due to just the sheer amount of IBR models. So we saw a lot of like network convergence errors. And generally, just uncertainty of the IBR model response. As you know, uh, in positive sequence simulations, we, we can't represent the fast inner loop controls and their PLLs. Uh, we're also worried about any potential control interactions between IBR plants. And just uh, simply, we didn't have grid forming models available in PSSC. And they're still unavailable to this day. So the grid forming study took a longer amount of time just because of its nature being in EMT software and the long simulation times. So. After this grid following study was completed, the stage two projects were allowed to move on in the interconnection pro process in parallel to this grid forming study. So we can see this grid forming study uh, came out of the IRS and this was allowed to complete in parallel. So the grid forming study results were fin finalized several months ago, back in June, 2021. Uh, the key system issues and learnings that came out of the study are listed here, but we'll be going over some of these in detail in the next slides. Uh, and after these stage two studies are completed, there's an immediate need to perform a near-term system stability study, uh, given the findings of this grid forming report. So this near-term study is an internal study and it's currently ongoing with an expected completion date of quarter one, 2022. So the difference here is in this study, it's more of like an in-depth look into the system as compared to an IRS, where over here we'll study all potential contingencies versus just a select few in the IRS. Okay. So for the rest of my presentation, I'll be sharing the results of our recent island-wide ENT studies of grid forming inverters, which is the grid forming study that I just described. Uh, the slides uh, upcoming are adapted from the study report as publicly available, this link here on the bottom. So these are some of the key takeaways 
that we learned from the study. Uh, the study was bleeding edge in the following aspects. So analyzing these aggressive IBR penetration scenarios beyond what is well understood. And the use of grid forming for system stability at this scale is uh, still emerging. Uh, we found that these results bring awareness for potential future issues that may need to be addressed. Uh, grid forming results are positive development, but not the silver bullet solution. Uh, more work is needed to fully replace services provided by synchronous gen generators, such as protection, et cetera and grid forming is just one piece of the puzzle. Uh, we need to continue to work with the industry to improve the EER performance and capabilities. And we also need to continue to work with industry and developers to uh, fine tune grid forming inverter capabilities and standards. Okay, uh, so these are the generation scenarios that we analyze for each major island in the study. Uh, just a few important points to mention. The total synchronous generation for all islands shown here in orange ranges from 5 to 15%. The total DER generation shown in green is, is about 50% of the load, total load. And then the centralized IBR projects fill in the remaining gaps for generation here. So this existing and stage one IBR generally are grid following devices. And for here is stage two IBR and FAS. Uh, these were studied with grid following and grid forming implementations of their plants. So in total, we have about up to 95% IBR penetration. And the main question is, uh, will it work? Okay, in addition to that, that one question, we have other specific concerns. Uh, will there be any reliability concern in this time frame? So just for some context, uh, 2023 was the original in-service year for these projects. Uh, so are there any issues we weren't able to capture uh, with the PSCC study? <clears throat> okay. Uh, can grid forming technology improve reliability or system performance as compared to having only grid following devices? Uh, are there any risks to using this grid forming technology? So looking at any kind of control interactions such as that. Or what needs to be done to mitigate risks and meet renewable energy targets? So this is more uh, forward looking to future RFPs and system studies. Like what do we need to study? address. Okay, the first key conclusion from the study. So with the stage two projects in grid following mode and this level of IBR penetration, the system was not stable in steady state for Oahu and Maui. So this is no fault. This is just doing a, a flat run in the model. So when the dynamics were released in the EMT models, these oscillations began to form here. See here. Uh, so the plots here show the total generation on the system at the top in megawatts and the system frequencies here on the bottom. So this, uh, these oscillations resulted in under frequency low shedding in the Maui case and in the case for Oahu you see these uh, sustained oscillations here. Okay, in contrast though, when the stage two projects were switched to the grid forming models, the system was stable in steady state. So this is a comparison of the plot earlier for Maui. You can see here, this is the flat response that we expect. So one of the key recommendations coming out of the study is to continue to require grid forming technology and to implement it for uh, all incoming projects on all islands. So, so uh, implement it here, meaning we should have it on grid forming mode from the beginning, rather than applying this mode when, when it's needed. And this kind of allow, allows operators to obtain 
experience operating with these uh, grid forming plants so we can uh, see if there are any issues in the future. Another recommendation is to review the grid forming requirement documents for future RFPs. And this includes uh, clarifications based on lessons learned in the study. Okay, before we go over the full results, just a brief overview of the island-wide PSCAD model for each island. So we have hundreds of buses and DER machines. We have a small amount of synchronous machines and IBR plants here. So to run a single contingency using the latest 64 core CPU, so these are like AMD thread rippers, it took about five to seven hours just to run a single contingency. And to run the whole contingency set, which is about uh, maybe 17 to 34 contingencies, it took about three to six days of simulation time. And that doesn't include any analysis. Uh, here's a summary of the results. The column on the left here shows the dispatch that is studied for each island. The second column here represents grid following, grid following results. And you can see the N minus condition is not stable for the Oahu severe dispatch and the Maui dispatch. Uh, N minus zero is stable for this less severe dispatch for Oahu and Hawaii, but uh, we saw under frequency load shedding and uh, instability under contingency. This column here in the middle represents grid forming results prior to any tuning. Any tuning. So all of the N minus zero conditions were stable, but uh, still result in instability and significant under frequency load shedding. So just to note, out of the box, grid forming models uh, didn't perform optimally. And uh, many plants required significant tuning just to get uh, these results in the last column. Okay, so these last, this last column represents grid forming results with tuning. So you can see the system performance improved uh, substantially uh, with the exception of this uh, top dispatch, Oahu severe dispatch here. Uh, so Oahu did study two dispatches. The severe dispatch was what I showed earlier in the 66 or data. And this wasn't stable under contingency under all variations. So we studied a less severe dispatch, which basically added uh, more synchronous generation online and reduced the amount of uh, IBR penetration that we saw in the case. Okay. Uh, common issues that were seen in the results across all three islands, DER blocking, or in other words, uh, momentary cessation, leading to system under voltage and under frequency load shedding. Uh, we also saw instability from grid forming projects when they hit their current or energy limits. So for example, projects would get stuck in this current limiting ride through mode after the fault is cleared. Uh, we saw significant voltage response tuning issues, such as uh, inadequate voltage support during and post fault. Uh, we had frequency response tuning issues, uh, mainly due to slow default droop response settings, which uh, ultimately end up resulting in unfixed low shading. Uh, we also saw undamped system oscillations. So after the, the disturbance, oscillations would persist. I uh, just want to note that this issue has been resolved after the study, but it doesn't eliminate the possibility for other sources of oscillation in the future. And then for project inverter frequency control, uh, some projects were not contributing substantially to voltage or frequency control. Uh, so for example, there weren't some projects didn't have any inverter level frequency watt controllers, or some held their pre-fault active current when in write-through mode, regardless of the frequency measured. 
And then also for grid following devices, we saw instability or tripping. So in some projects, there were aggressive volt var control response that might have caused them to be unstable or just uh, poor protection settings. <clears throat> okay, so let's go through some of the common issues. So one of the major risks in our system, as well as the biggest unknown, is the response of DER, which as I showed earlier, accounts for more than 50% of the total generation in all the dispatches that we studied. So DER, DER blocking or momentary cessation characteristics can have major impacts to system stability depending on the assumptions that we choose. So as for the example here, uh, this is a delayed clearing fault with zone two clearing. And you can see all the DER have blocked their output until the voltage has recovered. So this first graph here is the aggregate DER generation. We split it into three different vintages called P1, P2, and P3. Uh, P1, P2 basically just represent uh, what we call as legacy PV. And P3 is uh, with uh, some extended ride through settings. Uh, so the total DR is shown here in blue. Oh, not here. Uh, the second graph shows the total under frequency load megawatt on the system. The blue here is the gross load. And the orange here is the the amount of DER generation behind those EFLS circuits. And so the green curve is the resulting net load that can expect to be shed in the system. And then we have a uh, voltage and frequency for these uh, bottom two. So at here, the, the fault happens at 10 seconds. So we can see the, the fault is cleared around here, but the voltage hasn't recovered above the unblocked threshold uh, so for this study, it was assumed to be 0.9 per unit, which is pretty high, but uh, we've since updated this assumption in our future studies. And so this voltage not recovering above 0.9 results in the DER continuing to be blocked here. And this reduction in active power causes frequency to, to decline here until the under frequency load shedding is shed which helps to restore the voltage and frequency on the system. So as I briefly mentioned in the study, uh, very conservative DER momentary cessation parameters were used. And we've since revised it for uh, ongoing studies. Uh, we do plan to provide parameter recommendations uh, for future DER interconnection standards uh, based on these studies. Okay. Uh, so related to momentary cessation, these are the key characteristics that we believe have the greatest impact for a study. So under voltage block and unblock limits shown here as uh, numbers one and two here, where the red dotted trace. So here they are assumed to be the same. Uh, this uh, recovery recovery delay, number three, this is, this is the time between uh, when the unblock threshold is hit and when active current begins to recover. Uh, so this could be like a measurement, measurement time delay, or it could also be like an in intentional time delay, depending on the manufacturer. And then number four, this recovery ramp rate, uh, the rate at which active current returns to its nominal value. So have we seen these characteristics in the field? Uh, well, we haven't really seen widespread effects like I've shown the plot earlier. Uh, but these type of fault events are pretty rare in occurrence, which is like a three-phase fault and daytime with high DER. Uh, but we do see momentary cessation in larger centralized plants. So that can be an indication that uh, this type of behavior is also present in DER. And we really need a uh, high-speed monitoring, monitoring on the dis distribution side to help capture uh, this response. And so far, we only have two second SCADA data, but yeah, that's uh, much too slow. Or we could also analyze test data from actual inverters to help confirm if uh, these characteristics ex exist. 
and to what parameter. Okay, uh, we also saw instability of grid forming projects due to reaching current or energy limits. So the plot here is an example of the project output, real and reactive power, uh, voltage and frequency measurements. Uh, so you can see after the fault is cleared around here, uh, both the active power and reactive power start to dive below zero. This is the zero threshold. So they go way below, even though the voltage and uh, frequency is uh, still below, it's nominal. So this is actually worsening the under voltage and under frequency condition. So in this particular project, uh, it was found that the, the PLL gains were too high, which caused errors between the actual system phase angle and the, the system phase angle, angle that they were measuring which uh, resulted in incorrect current injection. Uh, we also found that the low voltage ride through reactive current injection settings were configured in an unstable manner. So that's why you saw this uh, large step change in reactive current for uh, very small voltage changes. So to mitigate that, uh, the voltage threshold where inverters returned from a special current limiting ride through mode was reduced. Uh, it took several rounds of tuning, eventually, which uh, eventually produced these sta stable results, but uh, further optimization of the response capability is still desired. Okay, in some plants, uh, even after post-tuning, the, re the response was not optimal for some specific contingencies and will require further control tuning. So in this plant here, uh, it previously had slow voltage response and was oscillatory in some cases. So it would lose stability for a short period during its recovery and it wouldn't support the system. Uh, most, conting most contingencies improved after modifying the low voltage ride through setting. Like I uh, mentioned in the, pre in the previous slide, but uh, during this particular contingency in this example here, uh, the project is uh, further exacerbating the under voltage condition here. So in the report, uh, it was noted that this suggests maybe the inverter here is prioritizing current limiting control over the grid forming control. And there are certain conditions uh, that we're not too sure of. Okay, uh, mass blocking of DER and delayed active power recovery can result in large amounts of under frequency load sharing. So as expected, uh, you know, we can just lower droops to provide a more aggressive response in order to, to mitigate under frequency load sharing. Uh, so we can configure IBR to respond much faster compared to trad traditional synchronous generation but uh, we do prefer uh, dedicated frequency response contingency resources to avoid issues with uh, oscillations or interactions between uh, multiple units with aggressive troops. So just for example here, uh, we see under frequency low sharing towards the end of the simulation, and this is caused by an aggregate loss of DER. You can see here a lot of the so the, the P, P1 and P2 devices tripped and we're left with maybe about half of what we had before. We also see uh, one of the stage one IBR projects trip off and, and th that was due to uh, bad protection settings. So we could probably uh, push more power out of the stage two projects to avoid this uh, under frequency load shedding here. And I'll show that in the next slide. So yeah, after tuning the droops, um, there was no more under frequency load shading. But even after reducing those settings, I'm sure you noticed already in the previous slide, uh, these oscillations that persist in the simulation. So at the time, the source of this oscillation was unknown. And there wasn't any uh, time or budget left to investigate those issues in that study. 
But since that study was released, uh, we did find the source of the oscillations and we uh, mitigated them. So in particular, that's the source of this oscillation was largely due to the modeling assumptions related to DER. So we had, we had a lot of DER machines and uh, some of them had very small amounts. So those very small amounts of DER were being approximated in the model using high impedance for voltage sources. So those typical voltage sources you can see in like PSCAD library models. Uh, that was used instead of the full DER model that was uh, developed in, for the simulation. So this was done uh, mainly for simulation and modeling optimization purposes, just to help increase the speed of the simulations. Uh, the, the dynamic performance of those small DER is insignificant, but uh, in aggregate, it did introduce uh, these oscillations when the system frequency was unable to return to 60 hertz. Uh, so by combining these small amounts of DER with uh, other larger amounts of full DER models, uh, the, os the oscillations had yet to be uh, reproduced. But this doesn't guarantee that uh, oscillations can, can't occur through other means. And also in our ongoing system spelly study, we're doing an, an eigenvalue analysis uh, to help identify any other potential modes of oscillation. Okay, uh, going through all the summary of recommendations in the report, uh, continue to require grid forming technology and implement it for incoming projects. Uh, how exactly it's implemented isn't important when the system is intact, uh, but the specific implementation, such as uh, manufacture and control revision of grid forming is critical when uh, faults or major system events uh, cause grid forming devices to reach their physical limits. Uh, feature RFPs should improve clarity on technical requirements. So you can consider specifying additional performance requirements, such as a uh, voltage control, like response characteristics, uh, we can also specify requiring overcurrent capability or a better transient response or other functions like, like FFR. Uh, we should also further validate and tune DER models. So for example, uh, we wanted to pursue single phase DER modeling to help improve the blocking representation for unbalanced faults. And we're currently, uh, we're currently doing this in our ongoing system security analysis. Uh, we should adjust existing and future DER block and unblock thresholds to be as low as possible and improve the ride through capability. So if possible, no blocking, no delay, and no ramp rate limits. Our unfrequency load shedding scheme should be reviewed and optimized to disconnect load without disconnecting uh, DER if possible. And continue studied, continue study with Equipment OEMs is required uh, as the equipment evolves. So maybe such as like equipment change, stuff like that. Uh, specific plans were given control change recommendations based on the post-tuning results. And most of them have agreed to these changes. Uh, understand system undamped oscillations. So as I mentioned, these are now understood, but uh, New projects, regardless of grid falling or grid forming, could introduce new modes of oscillation to the system. Uh, all large projects should be converted to grid forming if possible. So we did have a few uh, stage two projects that weren't able to provide grid forming during the study. And we did uh, see a few stage one projects that had the potential to be converted. Uh, frequency droops should be tightened if possible while making coordination. Uh, I guess more importantly, frequency and voltage control should be required from all resources and the burden should be shared. Uh, remote end delayed clearing should be reduced as much as possible by installing redundant protection schemes. This might be more uh, specific to Hawaii. We do have some, 
some lines that aren't redundant. But in general, uh, longer fault clearing times resulted in significantly worse results. And it does risk uh, tripping large chunks of DER on other voltages. And then finally, uh, high speed, high resolution recorders, such as DFRs, should be installed at critical locations for post event analysis and model validation. So we can also uh, install DFRs on the distribution end to understand uh, DER and load characteristics. And we do want to stress the importance of this point. Uh, this allows us to test the field performance against model performance. And so we had experienced some events where some of our existing plants have shown momentary cessation in the field, but it wasn't evident in the models that they provided for both uh, KCC and PSCAD. Okay, some ongoing study topics for us. Uh, DER modeling remains a top priority. So it's a dominant factor in dynamic performance, particularly relating to block or trip thresholds. And the DER really causes the most severe conditions on all of our islands. And in our most recent study, we've been refining these assumptions for the parameters I pointed out earlier. Uh, impl impl implications on protection schemes, so, such as uh, loss of fault current from synchronous machines. Under frequency really measurement uncertainty. So during our most recent study, we saw quite a bit of discrepancy between PSCC and PSCAT simulations. Uh, this, these are like big differences in system frequency measurements. So we would see large deviations in PSCC that would result in a lot of under frequency load shedding. But in PSCAT, we would see uh, small frequency deviations. Uh, it's possible this difference could be caused by grid following versus grid wearing models. But as I mentioned earlier, in PSSC, we only had the grid following model. But uh, in general, we're not sure what the correct way, what, what is the correct way to model these protection relays in PSCAD uh, in regards to the frequency measurement. So would they trip on frequency transients or do they have some kind of smoothing filter that's applied? Uh, system rate of change of frequency and DER response. So uh, loss of inertia causes high rates of change of frequency. And we don't have any Rokoff protection modeled for the DER. And even then, the modeling of this protection is also unclear. Uh, single line to ground faults and unbalanced tripping of DER. So unbalanced tripping of DER can potentially cause negative sequence oscillations in the remaining synchronous generation that's online. Uh, that's something that we've seen in our most recent study that's ongoing. Uh, this may need to, need to be addressed with other supplemental equipment such as statcoms. And then uh, exploring any benefits of synchronous condensers. Can this help with system stability? Uh, operating reserves on BEST is crucial to allow for responsive capability uh, and load modeling. We see a growing importance on accurate load modeling as the DER capacity increases and conventional generation is turned offline. Uh, so for example, what is the potential transient behavior of say EV loads or future DER programs? So these are some of the issues that uh, we're looking into and wanna address in the near term. Okay, uh, that's all I have prepared for today. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your time and attention. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go ahead and stop the recording.